Happy New Year! I hope you had a wonderful 2022 start, and I wish you were ear full of happiness, good health, success, joy, and abundance. This year at Innovators Box, our theme of the year is to create possibilities. We said this thinking of all the new possibilities, paths, innovators will be creating in this new hybrid workplace, and we look forward to celebrating it with everyone together. Speaking of which, one career that we'll be likely seeing more is the very topic we're about to dive into today. Speakers, authors, and experts who specialize in workplace communication. What is it like to speak and write for a living, and how are they doing this when everything is online and changing? Hi, I'm Monica Kang, founder and CEO of Innovators Box, and you're listening to Curious Monica. The more I learned about that space, I enjoyed it as much as I did the software development. So, you know, sometimes you just got to make a jump. You don't know what's around the corner until you get to the corner. I, I love writing and I, I'm pretty all right at it. So I was like, well, I can write it. And even as a writer or, you know, someone that is pretty decent at writing, it was very difficult to think about how a reader like empathize with a future reader of how are they going to take all of this? It's not just an article, it's a book. And so, and how do I make it non-obvious? How do I say something different? Being able to speak and write well is an amazing skill to have. I've always admired friends and peers who spoke and wrote well. It felt magical. Good writing and speeches inspire you, motivate you, and make you feel heard. That's powerful and a skill to hone. So I was always curious. What would it be like to do this full time? And how does one decide to want to become a speaker or a writer? I mean, do you start wanting to become a speaker to have a career as a speaker and writer? No, not necessarily. Having deep curiosity and drive to learn can be the start to how you find yourself as a speaker or a writer. You know, I grew up as a software developer and uh, led global software development teams in financial services for 20 plus years. Meet Don Corey. He may have started his career as a software developer, but today he is a speaker, author, and executive coach who helps people find more productivity and reclaim their time by teaching them when to say yes. He has a PhD in human and organizational systems from Field Graduate University and an MBA focusing on organizational behavior from Boston University. He has worked with diverse clients such as Ginkgo BioWorks, State Street Global Advisors, and Morgan Stanley. Today, he writes, consults, and speaks to empower leaders, teams, and companies how to find the best in them. And when I asked how he became the expert he is today, he shares how he had moments in life where saying yes to an opportunity led him to new roads. One such as where he is today as a speaker, coach, and author. It's no coincidence that he titled his book, when to say yes, we're simply saying yes to all or no to all is going to lead us to miss out on opportunities. And uh, I, that was my path. I expected I was going to do that forever. But there was a really interesting point where the roads diverged, let's say. And Bob Reynolds, who was the vice chairman of our company at the time in the early 2000s, was speaking to a group of senior leaders. And he said, I see it as a failure of our company when we have to hire leaders from outside. So, okay, the vice chairman is asking. He's essentially putting a call to action out there that it's your job to develop the next generation of leaders, right? So I learned as much as I could about leadership development and building high-performing teams and effective communication. And the more I did that, the more I loved that as much as I did developing software. So made the career shift and here I am with a leadership focus and a productivity focus. Don's decision to say yes to his curiosity to learn more about leadership and productivity not only led him to learn more about the space, but helped him build a niche out of this space. There were probably some connections that I made in my mind because I always have put a high value on leadership, even before that comment. 
So yes, I, I was ambitious. I gravitated to projects that were the highly visible, riskier projects that other people maybe stayed away from. And I just wanted to be visible and be more of a leader, show leaders of qualities. And I had some great mentors along the way and great bosses along the way that fostered that in me and pushed me to do those things. So here I am with a high value on leadership and the vice chairman asking us to develop leaders it was just a natural thing for me to say, let me learn more about that. So even while I was still employed, I got some training as an executive coach. And so I became really very much a coaching leader, which is a little bit more in vogue today than it was, say, 20 years ago, and took a coaching approach throughout. Look for patterns. What do you like? How much do you like it? And why do you like it? When you channel your curiosity to understanding why you like something so much, you may be surprised to discover how you may want to use your passion in a new career. Is it easy? No, and it isn't linear. Still, Don looks back realizing unless you try, you won't know. So start by wondering, what do you really enjoy? Don knew he wanted to build more expertise and leadership because he just loved the topic and field so much. What do I love most about leadership? I think it is leadership itself, meaning I'll just gravitate to raise my hand and say, I'll take charge on that or creating a team. So tying those two things together, leadership itself, and then having the ability, and I think I'm probably still growing in this, Okay, but how do you translate what you really like into a speaking career? Uh, how do you know you are ready? I asked Don how he knew he really wanted to build a niche in productivity and leadership. Was there an event that gave you that clarity or was it more over time? You're getting me to think here, Monica, because I'm wondering, was there a moment or did it naturally occur over time? And I think it was more naturally occurred over time. And as I said, the more I learned about that space, I enjoyed it as much as I did the software development. So, you know, sometimes you just got to make a jump. You don't know what's around the corner until you get to the corner. So, hey, I had a very successful career. I'm very pleased with it. I'm blessed that I love my first career and my second career. And there was a point where maybe I was getting a little stale after 21 years at one company, even though I had changed and I had played many different roles and within the company, I guess that need for change just was more compelling than more of the same. And it was, it was a scary jump. I'll tell you, it was, you know, from a very secure corporate job, successful, great company, a great people, you know, the company I worked with, they hired the best, like you were always working with smart people. And there's a beauty to that. So there was certainly some risk and that jump can be scary. But looking back, I'm thrilled where I am now. I wouldn't have built my speaking work, which I love to do. I love being on stage and I wouldn't have written a book probably. I, it would just would have been a very different path. Thanks for digging out some of that old stuff that was there. Yes, <laughs> I appreciated Don's honest insight on this because the truth is, no matter what career it is, sometimes we may not know how much we love or may be good at something until we get there. It may feel scary to jump into a new space or build something from scratch halfway through our career, but not doing so may be even scarier. I resonated with this reflection as I too had to make a pivot to be where I am today. And I wasn't always sure that I could enjoy a lot of what I'm doing today. Speaking, writing, and leading were all skills I practiced, but in my earlier career, I wouldn't really describe these as my strengths. I hesitated writing reports or speaking in front of audiences for I felt that wasn't really how I could shine. Looking back, I'm glad I forgot about how I used to be scared about public speaking or writing as I built Innovators Box because they became one of my core skills and turned out to be strengths in how I lead the team and what we do. I speak and write all the time now. <laughs> and I often now share that experience with aspiring writers and speakers. 
I tell them that if I started from where I was before, then you could do it too. Don is able to thrive as a speaker, author, and coach because he followed his curiosity to learn more about why he loved leadership and how he wanted to make a difference in meaningful ways. Check out his book, When to Say Yes, which may inspire you to know when you want to say yes to your leadership journey too. Okay, but I also have to really emphasize how the career of a speaker and author is not linear nor magical. While realizing what topic you love and why you want to do it is one thing, building a business and creating a high quality product and service is another. And through that journey, you may find yourself on a never ending roller coaster that goes up and down all the time. This is why when I think of inspiring speakers and authors, Salima is a friend who always comes to the top of my mind. Meet Salima Villani, the founder of Ripple Impact and the author of Innovation Starts With I. Salima is one of the most down-to-earth, driven, and thoughtful friends you'll want, who happens to have the grit and resilience in entrepreneurship, innovation, and is also not afraid to do something new. She is the friend and team member you want in any critical problem you are solving, as she brings a new lens with her diverse expertise. But part of what makes her unique is also her deep humility in how she shows up with what she does. Interestingly, I didn't realize, I wasn't aware at the time when I was in Brazil or Italy, like I didn't call myself an entrepreneur. I was not aware. I had, you know, just literally had to sign up for business license because the client asked for business license or whatever. So I was like, okay, these are the steps I need to do to make this happen. But I was in so much in survival mode and living out of this thing out of necessity. So, and it ended up doing really well, I would say not by accident per se, but I would say like, you know, the iterations and and maybe making the right decisions now that I look back at it. And and also maybe luck could be it's timing, technology, it's a bunch of factors. I met Salima in our size Johns Hopkins University Woman Entrepreneurship Network and was inspired by her thoughtful and down-to-earth way she saw the world. Her insights into problem solving are rooted in her personal experience, having to navigate so many challenges on her own and she realized how much entrepreneurs could benefit from her support. While she was busy living her life, she didn't realize how much inspiration and storytelling she could gift others until someone pointed out to her. Hey, Salima, you have an incredible story and journey. Could you share more to inspire others? That one conversation led to an opportunity, then to another, and each time Salima realized how important it is to stand back up again make the narrative your own path. You know, I ended up telling my story one time when I moved to the United States from Italy. And I learned a couple of years after I moved here that entrepreneurship was cool. And I realized I didn't have to be embarrassed about it anymore. Because for me, it was the thing I did because I couldn't get a job. And all my colleagues and classmates had great jobs and have all this experience. And I was like, well, I'm going to go do that dream job path. Realized very quickly, it wasn't really for me at the time. You don't know about the future, but at the time I was like, you know, I, I was missing that lifestyle of being an entrepreneur. And so when I went to an event, it was like a business boot camp, a lean startup machine event back in 2013. I told my story to one of the speakers who had come from elance.com who sponsored the event. And it was really hard for me to tell my story to a stranger. And she was so impressed. And she was like, oh, wow, you built remote teams. You had a successful business. And I was, I was super shy, but it was interesting how that led to a, you know, what we call a ripple impact. She was like, well, you know, I want you to become a storyteller. I'm going to give you this part-time job and, and you can go and now teach other entrepreneurs. We're going to open up this co-working space called WeWork soon. And I want you to like be that person that will launch these different WeWorks around the city and do lunch and learns and teach these entrepreneurs how to hire remote teams. And I started doing that, you know, my lunches, my after work, like I was still doing my day job, but I was going in networking and I was trying to get people to hire remote teams, but it was really hard. I got a lot of pushback, a lot of resistance. A lot of entrepreneurs were like, they came for free food, you know, had great catering and, and the lunch and learns and stuff, but they were, they were taking the hundred dollar promo, you know, that was giving them credit to go do a logo or something, but they didn't really believe in it. They were like, well, we prefer to hire local. We want people in the office. We want to have this like local culture and this and that. I was like, well, my thoughts were like, why not hire global so that you can build more local and, and hire the right talent locally and, you know, leverage other talent around the world for other things. And nobody really was wanted to listen. So I started, you know, eventually our startup education program failed, especially when we became Upwork and the whole um, acquisition happened. And so ultimately, uh, yeah, it was a really tough time. And then it's funny because I also stopped 
believing in it myself because I was like, oh, maybe that's not a thing anymore. Or maybe I can't do that anymore. And a few years later, I started to realize, well, I'm struggling. The whole local thing is really hard to just as an entrepreneur to, to just start up and be successful without a team. If you don't have the resources or you don't have venture capital, you don't have investors, it's really tough. And so ultimately, I ended up uh, when the pandemic happened, I started to tell a lot of people, well, now there's a lot of people at home and they're unemployed. And now we can work virtually. and We have to work virtually. And that's when I started to take the advice I used to give several years before that. And, and sure, I, I could have taken that advice and continued with that after working for Upwork. But ultimately, I took that pause and it's okay. But I, I remember that and I was like, well, this is coming back. And I started to train entrepreneurs and advise them and say, well, why don't you build your own team? And interestingly, I found that they didn't have all the hiring or managing skills or leadership skills to manage a team or to hire the right people. And so what happened was I ended up saying, well, why don't we grow my team? It was like two of us, you know, my assistant at the time and myself, and we were trying to figure out how can we help people. They didn't need just strategy. They needed execution help. And that's sort of where my new business for full impact was born was, well, let's become the team behind the scenes to all these entrepreneurs, you know, authors, people that really need help to grow their business and grow their platform and help them grow their team. So when they're done with the accelerator, you know, the time with us, they can also hire people and be in a position with their business so they can grow their own team remotely. So that's like the long story, but yeah, it all started way back in 2013. What I love most about Salima's honest reflection is her sharing of how it's okay to have ups and downs. The key is what you choose to do in the end. Yes, it would have been nice to have more participants who understood her early on, but because things didn't work out smoothly, she was able to expand her toolkit and learn how to help more people thoroughly. Her niche of understanding how to grow highly productive and agile teams remotely and globally became not only the secret sauce of how she works, but also how she helps other entrepreneurs rethink growth. To create the best she can, she does not stop. This is why also in her book journey, when she realized the final manuscript she had is not what she wanted, she was able to make the bold decision that others may have hesitated. Rewrite the book and delay the launch of the book to have the book right. So I would say, you know, really knowing why you want to write a book is important because that will help define the path that you take going forward because it is a very time consuming activity. Not everyone is a strong writer. And so there's different ways of going about that. For myself, I I love writing and I'm pretty all right at it. So I was like, well, I can write it. And even as a writer or, you know, someone that is pretty decent at writing, it was very difficult to think about how a reader like empathize with a future reader of how are they going to take all of this? It's not just an article, it's a book. And so, and how do I make it non-obvious? How do I say something different? How do I package it in an original combination? I know I can't say too many new things because everything, a lot of things have been said already and I'm not trying to invent something totally new, but how can I package existing things in a, in a newer way? And that's what I had to also accept was, you know, I really wanted to create the next business model canvas or the next big thing. And I realized, well, one of my interviewees was like, why don't you take all the existing tools that have helped you in and turn it into a journey. And then I was like, well, maybe that actually would be helpful since there's already a lot of great tools out there. And it, that ended up sparking a lot of new tools that I ended up adapting from other tools as well. So it was, it was really interesting how that whole journey happened. She decided to do a coffee challenge activity, an activity she grew to love to expand her network, learning and awareness that also coincidentally helped her find new opportunities and jobs in previous careers. She used it to meet as many innovation experts, entrepreneurs, and innovators as possible to learn how they bring innovation into their life and work to find the pattern she felt was missing in the market. What makes innovation really work? But it was one thing to identify the activity. It was another to realize how she could map out all the patterns and insights found from these conversations. She now had too much information and mapping it out became a full research process. She felt stuck. I think the biggest piece of advice I could give is don't start with an outline. (laughs) I think I got stuck for several months trying to outline things. Because that's the way, you know, research in the research world, we, we have to do it that way. But with the book, I would say Eric Custer, professor at Georgetown, I did one of his programs and it was interesting because he said that you start with, you know, my editor said this as well, start with a story and just write stories and then you can position them later. And then the outline sort of turns up when you position those stories and figure out what are the stories that you can tell the people? What are the, 
And I have this tool in my book called The Great Idea Checker. So when you're thinking about stories, what are stories that you can tell or ideas or messages that you want to share that are uh, you know, non-obvious, that kind of stand out or a little bit different? Are they concrete? Are they uh, timely? And are they useful? And I think those four things are really key to um, starting out. And then then you can iterate from there. And that's how my book also evolved in it. I decided to go the interview route. I also wanted to make the book global. So for me, it was important. I didn't want to just have the North American market. I wanted to have this book help people in emerging markets or in different countries. And so I said, uh, one of my interviewees said, well, my book felt like it was going to be very North American. So he was like, why don't you go to emerging markets and developing countries and, and just go and talk to entrepreneurs there, you know, go and um, do workshops and stuff. So I started doing that when I went on vacation or I was going for another business trip. I was like, well, why don't I just do a, a workshop for the local community, give something that's easy for me to teach. I have all the materials and the knowledge. And there are a lot of places I went to in Liberia, Morocco, Panama. They were very hungry to learn. And it was empowering and a huge learning experience for myself to go to those countries and do those workshops. And I infuse that into my book as well. Indeed. (laughs) The book that Salima created not only has extensive research from the 100 plus conversations she had with guests around the world, but also various tools she found to work best, original artwork and stories she shared of her journey. Salima's writing and speaking inspire and empower many because of her deep intention and humility that drive how she shows up to what she does. I asked how she got to think in this way to care so much about others and be willing to put in the deep work to get the quality she wants to see. Her drive for all of that hard work stems from curiosity. Yep, one of my favorite words. So I would have to say it's uh, exactly the work that you do, you know, because I use a lot of the stuff like your cards and a lot of the things from Innovator's Box and and just, I'm really curious and I would say it's a curiosity. I love questions. I love being asked questions. I love being interviewed. I love stories. I love uh, trying new things. And I think that having a curious mind and I'm like, well, usually that's how great ideas happen. And when you ask that previous question about the decision-making, I think, again, it's about testing those things and you can test them at a very small scale. And what's the worst that can happen? I mean, you try to set it up so it's not going to be a huge failure. You set up a smart failure. So I was like, well, let me go and test that. And when I tested that first workshop, I think I did one in Portugal and it was really successful. And I was like, oh, wow, what if now I take this to like developing countries and then did that in Liberia? It didn't cost me much, right? Just some of my time and, and some prep work, but it didn't really cost me much because I was going there anyways. And so it was amazing to test it and see how successful and everywhere I went, super successful, a lot of interest. And I was like, well, that idea ended up working and I ended up learning so much. It was definitely slightly uncomfortable. Because I was like, why are we doing a workshop at 7 p.m. on a Friday night in Morocco? Like, who's going to come to that? And we had to like do it on the rooftop initially, which is so many people. And we're like, okay. And thankfully, it was pre-COVID, right before COVID. So I managed to luck out on a lot of that right before the pandemic happened, uh, which now would be a different story. So, Yes, curiosity is so important. Being open to learning, understanding, and trying new things permitted Salima to not only do new things, but find her niche in speaking, writing, and helping entrepreneurs grow in new ways. As Dawn shared earlier, unless we try, we won't know what we can do or how much we will be enjoying something. Like Salima and Dawn, I too would not have known that I love or enjoy speaking, facilitation, and writing. And now, having published two books, hosting two podcasts, and many more new creative productions on top of the usual services we do, I'm even more curious what else we could do to make creativity accessible for all. So follow your curiosity and don't limit what you think it would lead you to. These are powerful lessons and reminders to follow, not just for those who want to be a speaker or a writer, but for everyone building their career to find purpose. So what are you curious about today? And where would you want to explore? Write down a few and make it an intention to check it out. You never know what you'll find behind the end of the road. Thank you, Don Corey and Salima Valeni, for taking a moment to join our show to share your story. Please take a moment to learn more about their work and journey on our show notes. This was your host, Monica Kang, founder and CEO of Innovators Box, and you're listening to Curious Monica. Thank you again for joining us. 
I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Hope you are off to a wonderful new year and can't wait to continue celebrating new stories at Curious Monica. See you next week. Hi, I'm Sam, an audio engineer at Innovators Box, and I hope you're enjoying Curious Monica. I got curious about audio and music when I was still in elementary school. At eight years old, I was trying to put a band together, and by 12, I was starting to make recordings with my friends. And I'm still going. <laughs> this show is brought together by our amazing podcast team at Innovators Box Studios. Shout out to our audio engineering, me, <laughs> Kelly Gravo on marketing, website designer Akriti Pandey, graphic designer Monica Escobar, Leah Orsini on social media graphics, Sarah Piedraita and Floor on project assistance, and Luke Helder on music. And of course, this show is hosted and directed by the curious woman herself, Monica Kang, founder and CEO of Innovators Box. To continue the curiosity and creativity of the workplace, visit us at innovatorsbox.com. Also, don't forget to subscribe, leave a review, and share. Would love to hear what you're curious about and what mysteries Monica can uncover in our next episodes. See you next week. Hey, it's Monica King from Innovators Box. Thanks for watching this. I'm so glad you're here. I hope this inspired you to be creative, curious, and courageous. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share this video to spread creativity for all. See you soon and have a wonderful, magical day.